In the morning, after roll call and breakfast were over, they got their first lesson at the midden. Commandant! A man called across the wire fence from the men's camp. Commandant coming! A woman took up the cry. He's coming, Rivka said urgently to Hannah and Shifri, who were standing near the cauldrons where they had been helping dish out the watery soup. Do what I do. Rivka put her hand up to her mouth as if shouting, but instead made a penetrating clucking noise by placing her tongue against the roof of her mouth. From all over the camp came the same clicking, as if crazed crickets had invaded the place. The small children, alerted by the sound, came scrambling from everywhere. They raced toward the midden heap behind the barracks. Even the camp guards joined in, alternately clucking and laughing, waving the children on toward the garbage pile. The largest children carried the littlest ones in their arms. There were about thirty in all. Hannah watched amazed at their speed. When they got to the midden, they skinned out of their clothes and dove naked into the dump. Suddenly, Hannah noticed that one of the camp babies was still cradled in a wash tub. Without stopping to ask, she grabbed it up and ran with the child into the middle of the midden. Garbage slipped along her bare legs. She waded through a mixture of old rags, the used bandages, the emptied out waste of the slop buckets. The midden smell was overwhelming. Though she'd already gotten used to the pervasive camp smell, a cloudy musk that seemed to hang over everything, a mix of sweat and fear and sickness and the ever-present smoke that stained the sky, the smell in the midden was worse. She closed her eyes and lowered herself into the garbage. The baby clutched in her arms. When the all-clear clucking finally came, Hannah emerged from the heap with the baby, who was cooing. She scrubbed them both off with the rag until the child's mother, Lay, came running over. I will murder that Elihu Kropnik. Where is he? He is supposed to take her in. Look! You left her clothes on. They are filthy. Lay's face was contorted with anger. No thanks? Rivka asked. Lay. She saved the baby. Lay stared for a moment at Hannah, as if seeing her for the first time. Then, as if making an effort, she smiled. I will organize some water she said, leaving the filthy baby in Hannah's filthy arms. That means thank you, Rivka said. Hannah stared after Lay. I think, she said slowly, I think I prefer the water to the thanks. That night, she washed out her dress with a cup of water, hanging it like a curtain from her sleeping shelf. Now she understood why the children had all stripped off their clothes, dropping them like bright rags on the sandy ground. She'd worried that the clothing would be gaudy signals to the commandant, but clearly he already knew, as did the guards, where the children hid. It was all some kind of awful game. But she'd been too scared to stop and too shy to undress out in the open like that, especially while the memory of her naked hours waiting for the shower still brought a blush to her face, especially as the guards, some in their late teens, had all been laughing nearby. As she fell asleep, she was sure the smell of the midden had gotten into her pores, and that there was not enough water in the camp, in all of Poland, to wash her clean. The days quickly became routine. Roll call, breakfast, work, lunch, work, supper, work. The meals were all watery potato soup, and occasionally bread, hard and crusty. Then they had a precious hour before they were locked in the barracks for the night. The work was the mindless sort. Some of it was meant to keep the camp itself running, cleaning the barracks, the guards' houses, the hospital, the kitchen, cutting and hauling wood for the stoves, building more barracks, more privies. But most of the workers were used in the sorting sheds, stacking the clothing and suitcases and possessions stolen from the prisoners, dividing them into piles to be sent back to Germany. Still, Anna was glad of the routine. As long as she knew what to expect, she wasn't frightened. What was more frightening was the unknown, the occasional corpse hanging on the gate without an explanation, the swift kick by the Blakova for no reason. She and Shifri were set to work with Rivka in the kitchen, hauling water in large buckets from the pump, spooning out the meager meals, washing the giant cauldrons in which the soup cooked, scrubbing the walls and floors. It was hard work, harder than Hannah could ever remember doing. Her hands and knees held no memory of such work. It was endless and repetitive, but it was not without its rewards. Occasionally, they were able to scrape out an extra bit of food for themselves 
and lit the little ones while cleaning the pots. Burned piece of potatoes that had stuck to the bottom. Even burned pieces tasted wonderful, even better than beef. She thought she remembered beef. She gave the block of eye gold ring she organized to get you in here, Lay explained, wiping her hands on a rag and nodding her head in Rifka's direction. Lay was the head of the kitchen crew. Her arms were always splotchy and stained, but it was a good job, for she could keep her baby with her. Otherwise, that one. <coughs> she spit on the ground to show her disapproval of the three-fingered woman. She would have had you hauling wood with the men, and you would never have lasted because you are a city girl. It is in your hands. Not a country girl like Shifri. We outlast you every time. When Hannah tried to thank Rifka, the girl only smiled and shrugged away the thanks. My mother, res may she rest in peace, always said, Nemer is nicht kein geber. A taker is not a giver. And a giver is not a taker either. Keep your hands and hand it on. She said it gently, as if embarrassed. Hannah understood her embarrassment and didn't mention it again, but she did try to pass it on. She began saving the softer insides of the bread, slipping it to Reuben when she could. Yitzchak's little boy was so thin and sad-looking, still wondering where his sister had gone, that she could not resist him. She even tried giving her whole bread, meal after meal, until Gittle found out. You cannot help the child by starving yourself, Gittle said. Besides, with those big blue eyes, you will have many to help him. He made smile. And a bitter lip. Those big blue eyes and luminous, infrequent smiles reminded her of someone she couldn't name. But you, you are a growing child, Kaya. You must take care of you. She folded Hannah's hands around the bread and pushed her away from Reuben. Go. Finish your kitchen duties. I will take Reuven with me. Hannah turned away reluctantly, as if she had somehow failed Rivka. As she did so, she saw that Gittel had given the child her own bread, and half her soup besides. It was on the third day in the camp that Commandant Brewer came again. This time, word was whispered around the camp for a choosing. His black car drove right up to the middle of the camp, between the rows of barracks, the flag of the aerial snapping merrily. The driver got out, opened the rear door, and stood at attention. What is a choosing? Hannah asked Rifka out of the side of her mouth as they waited beside the cauldron they were cleaning. She didn't know why, but she could feel sweat running down her dress, even though it was a cool day, as if her body knew something it wasn't telling her mind. There was no movement from the midden pile, where the bright shorts and blouses of the children marked their passage. The commandant strode past without giving the dump a glance. Rivka hissed Hannah quiet and ran a finger across her own throat, the same signal that the peasants had made in the fields when the cattle cars passed by them. Hannah knew that signal. She just didn't know what it meant. Exactly. She shivered. The commandant was a small, handsome man, so clean-shaven his face seemed burnished. His cheekbones had a sharp edge, and there was a cleft in his chin. He stopped for a moment in front of Hannah, Rivka, and Shifri. Hannah felt sweat run down her sides. The commandant's smile pinched Rivka's cheek, then went on. Behind him was a man with a clipboard and a piece of paper. They walked without stopping again, straight to the far end of the compound. The door banged behind them ominously. Rivka let out a ragged breath and turned to Hannah. <sighs> Anyone who cannot get out of bed today would be chosen, she said. Her voice was soft, but matter of fact. Chosen for what? Hannah asked, though she'd already guessed. Chosen for processing. You mean chosen for death, Hannah said. Then suddenly she added, Hansel, let out your finger that I may see you are fat or lean. <gasps> Do not use that word aloud, Rivka cautioned. Which word? Hannah asked. 
finger? Fat? Lean? Rivka sighed. <sighs> Death. But why? asked Shifri, her pale face taking color from the question. Why will someone be chosen? Because they cannot work, said Rivka. And work. Her voice became very quiet. For the first time, Hannah heard a bitterness in it. Because work mocked Frey. And because he enjoys it, added Lay, coming over to see why they were not working. But do not let them hear you use the word death. Do not let them hear you use the word corpse. Not even if one lies at your feet, Rivka warned. A person is not killed here, but chosen. They are not cremated in the ovens. They are processed. There are no corpses, only pieces of dreck, only schmatz, rags. But why? asked Hannah. Why? Lay said. Because what is not recorded cannot be blamed. Because that is what they want. So that is how it must be. Quickly, back to work. No sooner had they begun scrubbing again than the door to the hospital opened and Commandant Brewer emerged, still smiling, but broader this time. As he and his aide passed by, Hannah could see the paper on the clipboard was now covered with numbers and names. The Commandant reminded her of someone. A picture, perhaps. A moving picture. She'd seen a smiling face like that somewhere. Dr. Dr. Mengele, she said suddenly. The angel of Auschwitz. As suddenly as she knew it, the reference was gone. No, Rivka said, puzzled. His name is Brewer. Why did you say that? I told you she says strange things, Shifri put in. Hannah looked down at her hands. They were trembling. I, I don't know why I said that. Am I becoming a Muslim? Am I going mad? No one answered. Gittel had been working in the store, sh sorting shed where mountains of clothes and shoes, mounds of books and toys, and household goods from the suitcases and bags were divided up. It was also the place where the men and women could talk together, so there was a quick, quiet trading of information from the women's camp to the men's and back again. That night, Gittel shared the news with the others of the Zugangi barracks. All the clothes and shoes in good condition go straight to Germany. And yet what we get is left. But look what I took for you, Kayola. She held up a blue scarf. Organized. You organized it, Tante Gittel, Shifri cried out, her hands up with delight. The woman all laughed. The first time such a sound had rippled to the barracks since they had arrived. Yes, she organized it. Gittel looked up, pursed her lips for a moment, then smiled. All right. I organized it. How did you do it, Gittel? Someone called. You bet she cannot... You bet she did not ask, came an answer. Gittel nodded, stretching the scarf between her hands. As me forget, I shall be strife. Hannah translated mentally. If you ask permission, the answer is no. She remembered suddenly another phrase from somewhere else, almost like it. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. She had a brief memory of it printed on something, like a shirt. So, said Esther's mother, a self-satisfied look on her face, we may be Zugangi, but we already know how to organize. Esther looked longingly at the blue scarf and hummed quietly to herself. Gittel handed the scarf to Hannah. To replace the blue ribbons, she said softly. The blue ribbons? For a moment, Hannah couldn't remember them. Then she did. And, because today is your birthday, Gittel added. Her birthday, cried Shifri. You did not tell me. Hannah shook her head. My birthday is... is in the winter. In... in February. The word sat strangely on her mouth. What nonsense is this? asked Gittel, her hands on her hips. And what kind of word is February? 
They taught you to count the days by the Christian calendar in Lublin? She turned to look at the woman who were circled around them. You think I do not know my own niece's birthday? And did I send a present every year? Of course you know, a gray-haired woman called out. I remember the day she was born, said another. You told me in the synagogue, all happy with the idea. You were only 13, you said, and already an aunt. So, Giddle said, turning to face Hannah. Her certainty overrode Hannah's own. Besides, she asked herself, who knew what day it was, what year, in this place? Thank you, Giddle, she whispered. It's the best present I've ever had, I think. The only one I remember, anyway. Oh, my dear child, Giddle said, pulling her close. Thank God that your father and mother are not alive to see you now. Caught in Giddle's embrace, Hannah suddenly remembered the little house in the shtetl and the big embracing arms of Shmuel. What of Shmuel? she said. In Yitzchak, are they... Well? Giddle sat on a low shelf bed and pulled Hannah down next to her. The circle of women closed in, eager for news. Giddle nodded. Now listen. Shmuel is working with the crew that cuts wood, but it is all right. It is what he knows how to do, and he is strong. With him are Yitzchak the Butcher and Gedela and Natim Brodonek, and their cousin Nemuel. Sadik the Cobbler is doing what he has always done, making shoes and belts. They have a cobbler shop there. He is making a fine pair of riding boots for the commandant. Size five. That is a woman's size, Esther's mother said with a laugh. <laughs> yes, and they have made up a little rhyme about it. Listen, I will tell it to you. Brewer wears a lady shoe with a cockle doodle doo. The woman began to giggle. Hannah didn't understand the humor. Giddle held up her hand and the laughter stopped. And for Viosk, Naftali, the goldsmith, is making rings on order for all the SS men. He is a very sick man, but they like his work so much they are leaving him alone. And where does he get the gold? asked the woman in a stained green dress. From the Valises, idiot, someone else answered. From our fingers, Fig said suddenly, the first time she had spoken in days. She held up her hand so that everyone could see that they were bare. From our ears. From our dead, Giddle whispered. Hannah wondered whether anyone else heard her. What about the others? Esther's mother asked. I do not remember anything more, Giddle said softly. What about the rabbi? Asked the woman with the hair lip. What about Rabbi Baruch? Giddle did not answer. Fag knelt down in front of her, putting her hands on Giddle's skirt. You are sisters, Giddle, she said. I am your brother's wife. You must tell me about my father. Giddle closed her eyes and pursed her lips. For a long moment, she did not speak. But her mouth opened and shut as if there were words trying to come out. At last she said, Chosen, yesterday, Baruch Diana Mace. Fag opened her mouth to scream. The woman in the green dress clapped her hand over Fag's mouth, stifling the scream, pulling it, her onto the sandy floor. Three other women wrapped their arms around her as well, rocking back and forth with her silent sobs. Chosen, Giddle said explosively, her eyes still closed. Along with Zadik the tailor, the Badkan, the butcher from Viosk, and two dozen others, and the Rendar. Why? The rabbi was in the hospital. His heart was broken. Zadik too. He had been beaten almost to death. The Badkan, because he chose to go. They say, he said, this is not a place for a fool where the idiots are in charge and the others whose names I do not remember, for crimes I do not know. And the Rendar. With all his money he could not buy his way out? asked Esther's mother. In this place he is just a Jew, 
like the rest of us, said Geralt. Like the rest of us. Like the least of us. He's a schmuck now, said Hannah, remembering Rivka's words. Geralt opened her eyes and slapped Hannah's face without warning. That may be camp talk out there, but in here we say the prayer for the dead properly, like good Jews. Get over there, someone murmured. Hannah looked up, hand on her smarting cheek. She could not find the speaker, so spoke to them all. Giddle is right, she said, her cheek burning. Giddle is right. Giddle began reciting the Kaddish, rocking back and forth on the sleeping shelf with the sonorous words, and the prayer was like the, to the tolling of a death bell. The rest joined her at once. Hannah found she wasn't saying the words along with them. Even though her mind didn't seem to have any memory of the prayer. Yis Kadeo, Yis Kadash, Shemei Rabo, 